Hey everyone, welcome back to Song of Saya. We are currently on part 7. So, we just uh, figured out what happened to Yo, and we are now back in the well with Koji, I believe. He has been buried alive. His world is the silence and cold of the grave. Ever since his voice gave out, and he lost the strength to scream, no coherent thought has passed through Koji's mind. Perhaps this is his brain's way of protecting him from despair. Instead, he dreams. Images flash before his eyes. Random, unconnected scenes from his 20 years of life. Not all of them are happy times. There are sad, painful memories as well. But even those are pleasantly warm compared to the death that is now encroaching upon him. He dreams of mountains. His older brother once took him hunting for insects when he was a child. They sealed their caught butterflies in a plastic bag, only to later find themselves holding a bag of dead butterflies. He dreams of his lover. They met at a mixer, where he'd been the only one to realize that she couldn't hold her liquor. After she'd had too much to drink, he looked after her while she vomited in the back alley. They toasted each other with canned juice, and then... He dreams that he is driving into a dark sea. When he reaches the bottom, he looks up to see the moon shining through the surface of the water. As he gazes up at the circle of light, entranced by its roundness and brilliance, the distant rumbling of an engine reaches his ears. Something still conscious within him tells him that his dream is wrong. Have I ever gone diving before? At night? The dots begin to connect in his mind, forming a barrier to separate his dreams from reality. What is bothering him? Of course, the sound. The engine rose, gradually fading into a low idling, and then abruptly gave way to silence, followed by the sound of the door opening and closing. This isn't a dream. These sounds are real. Understanding comes like a sudden blow. This isn't the bottom of the sea, and that circle of light isn't the moon. It's the mouth of the well. The sun has already risen and someone is right outside of the car. The last piece falls into place, as he becomes Tono Koji once more. Koji shouts, surprised at how easily his voice emerges. His desperation blocks out the pain of his raw throat. He keeps screaming with all of his might. Soon the echoes in this cramped well become deafening, and he is no longer certain if his screams have meaning or if he's just howling wordlessly. Nevertheless, he continues. His only desire is to be heard, lest he die forgotten at the bottom of this well. Koji's wait is not long, for even a minute feels like eternity when you're hanging by your fingertips from the edge of despair. Soon, the circle of light above him is partially eclipsed by the silhouette of a person staring down into the well. It's a woman's voice. Could you have heard it somewhere before, but for some reason he can't remember to whom it belongs. The silhouette vanishes, restoring the light to a perfect circle. Fear of being left alone again threatens to send Koji into a panic, but his reason is recovering enough to resist. She said she's going to get me out. I haven't been abandoned. While waiting, he gingerly tests his body which he's forgotten all about until now. His joints ache and his fingers and toes are numb, but though exhausted, he's still in one piece. After some time, the silhouette reappears at the top of the well. Koshi lacks the confidence to attempt such a feat. His frozen fingers can barely move. <laughs> After a brief pause, the owner of the voice tosses down a knotted climbing rope into the well. He grabs the rope as soon as it reaches him. The rough threads bite into his palm, and relief nearly overwhelms him at the sensation. This really is happening. He really is safe. Now that he's free from despair, questions leap to the forefront of his mind. The first among them, who is his savior? The rope shakes as the woman climbs carefully down. The beam of light 
slinging over his shoulder, pushing back the shadow cast by her body. As soon as she's standing in the same mud as Koji, he finds himself looking face to face with... Koji could not have imagined that his savior would turn out to be Dr. Tango Roko, neurosurgeon at the T University Medical Center. Of course, it took him a moment to recognize her. Instead of a white gown and tight skirt, she was wearing a heavy leather coat, denim jeans, and boots with no real heel. She must have expected a hike through the mountains. Her light is a blocky, all-purpose type of feature, and side-mounted fluorescent runners in addition to the main floodlight, survival gear, and professional grade by the look of it. <laughs> Dr. Tanbo says wearily as she try, uh, gives Koji a once-over. He pulls out a flask from her pocket and hands it to him. She walks around with a flask? Maybe Koji's just old-fashioned, but it doesn't seem appropriate for a young woman, and a doctor at that. Nevertheless, he unscrews the cap and takes a swig, and struggles to keep him coughing as the potent liquids sears his tongue. Her tone is straightforward and quite serious. Koji can only gape at the doctor, the dark smile on her face doing little to ease his confusion. Is this really Dr. Tanmo? There's no trace of the bookish, mild-mannered woman Koji met at the hospital. Her expression is now a hard mask, and her eyes are sharp and wary. In the darkness at the bottom of the well, it is possible, however unlikely, that the change in her features is due to the ominous shadows cast by her lamp. It's not so easy, however, to explain the change in her demeanor. Roko replies brusquely. Glaring at Toji like an annoyed professor. Koji still doesn't understand why she acted so quickly, but it's a different part of what she says that seizes his attention. That's right. He almost died at the hands of the man he thought was his best friend. Anger and frustration welled inside of him. He can't forgive Fuminori's betrayal, nor can he forgive himself for his foolishness. And now he has no idea if Scuba is safe. Fuminori tried to kill Koji. Could he have done the same to her? Ryoko says irritably, turning away to examine the inside of the well. Koji says to her, back. Still engrossed in her examination of the walls, Ryoko laughs scornfully at the idea. Annoyed by her condescending attitude, Koji is about to demand answers when she cuts him off with a gesture and shines her light at a corner of the wall. Tonokun, In the light of the lamp, Koji sees that some of the stones are a different shade than the rest of the wall. This must be what Ryoko was looking for. Ryoko's gaze moves slowly along the wall, finally coming to rest on the gap between two of the stones. The hole is just wide enough for an adult to reach into open-handed. Ryoko says with a grim smile. 
She wastes no time thrusting her hand into the opening. After she feels around for a few seconds, Koji hears the thunk of something solid coming together behind the wall. Sensei! Ruka pulls her hand out and gives the different colored stones a gentle push. With a rumble, the weight's shifting, and the stone slides smoothly black into the wall. Koji wants answers, but Ryoko ignores him and peers into the opening. In the beam of her floodlight, Koji can see a concrete tunnel leading into the mountain. Her warning is simple and utterly devoid of warmth. Considering his option, Koji looks from the tunnel to the rope and back again. He's practically sweating now thanks to the 190 proof vodka he just drank. But although feeling a return to his fingers, he still doesn't have the strength to climb. That said, the thought of being alone in the well again makes him shiver. <laughs> Ryoko steps into the tunnel without looking back, and Koji doesn't hesitate to follow. Koji says sarcastically, following Ryoko as she moves cautiously down the tunnel with her light lighting the way. ここは病院じゃない。君は患者じゃない。営業スマイルが必要か。じゃあ、こっちが先生の字ですか。さあ、どうだかな。Ryoko suddenly stops and stares at the floor. When Koji looks over her shoulder, he sees a dust-covered rope lying coiled up in the middle of the path. なんです? あの井戸から降りてきたやつの小細工さ。Ryoko picks up the rope, examines it, and hands it to Koji. Nagasawa Brilliant. Ryoko shines her light down the tunnel, revealing that it ends in a closed wooden door about 10 meters ahead. こうやってここに逃げ込んだやつは追って飲めを食らませたのさ。先生、さっき前にも来たっていうのは、ああ、君は先坂君だけじゃない。私も以前、王外を追ってこの別荘に来た。Ryoko says dryly. As Ryoko speaks, she opens her coat and pulls out what she had out hanging underneath it. At first, Koji thinks that she's holding a steel pipe. Amazed that she could be carrying a weapon, Koji looks closer and is appalled when he sees what it really is. A gun. And it's not one of those sleek handguns that he sees in the movies, but a double-barreled shotgun. The stock and barrels have been sawn down for easier concealment, enhancing its aura of brutality effect. Ryoko replies blandly, as though naming a brand of cigarettes. Ryoko looks over her shoulder and gives Koji her most chilling smile yet. The woman whom Koji believed was a normal doctor waves her off shotgun menacingly as she continues. Her torn sharp and Bitter.あの時にこいつがあったなら、私は多分王外をきっちり殺せていただよ。そうなってれば、もしかしたら君たちがこんな災難に巻き込まれることもなかったかもしれない。そう。Ah. Oh. listens in silence. How much to do anything but watch as understanding moves further and further out of her grasp. だから、これから私がやることは一切合切。
君とその友達が足を突っ込んでる泥沼のありさまを終わらせてやるための手続きだその辺をよく理解して余計な口は突っ込まないこといいね Could you only nod weakly in response? With a light in her left hand and a shotgun in her right, Ryoko walks up to the door and takes a deep breath. Then she kicks the door open, putting her full weight behind the blow. With a disappointedly feeble sound, the door breaks off its hinges and falls into the room, dust billowing like white smoke in the beam of Ryoko's light. The large room, at least 30 meters square, The tiled floor is set with drainage grates, and there's no mistaking the operating table sitting in the middle of the room. Cabinets full of、um, enamelware and drugs line one side of the space. Against the opposite wall stands a writing desk and bookshelves. Even Koji can recognize that much. The mysterious objects cluttering the tables and shelves, however, are beyond his comprehension. Mirrors delicately engraved with Complex patterns, grotesque statues and masks that must have been left by a race of savages, tapestries woven in nauseating arrays of colors, a crystal ball the size of an infant's head. Anyone would fetch a hefty price in an antique store, if not for the one thing they all have in common. Every last piece is so loathsome and foul that Koji feels sick just looking at it. It is as though each was designed for the sole sinister purpose of immortalizing. His creator's hatred of the world. Rare looking books of the sort that he found in Ogai's home are piled here and there, and on the one shelf are stacked some scrolls that look to be made of some kind of sheepskin or papyrus. Whatever it is, it's not paper. Finally, there are some indecipherable chalk patterns and symbols filling every available space on the walls. Even the two sliding blackboards are covered in strange, unreadable scribbles. Just looking at them is making Koji dizzy. Miru, じゃない Ryoko snaps at him. いいかここから動くな絶対に何かに触ったりするな目を引くようなものがあっても見つめたりしちゃいけないまずいと思ったらすぐに目をそらして自分の靴を見ろわかったははあ、Ryoko switches her lights for us and runners on. And sets it on a nearby table where it can illuminate the whole room. She then holsters her shotgun, only to pull out an even more confusing set of tools a digital camera and a can of spray paint. She gives the can in her left hand a shake, switches the camera on her right on, and steps up to the blackboard while looking at the camera's side mounted screen. After recording one set of symbols, she covers it with a thick layer of paint, then moves on to the next. あの、先生レッスン1妙な図形やラテン語の文章とかは絶対に読むな見つめるな機械の目で記録しておいて後で注意深く調べればいい現物はその場で塗りつぶすか何かして破壊しろ Now she mentions it, Koji realizes that she's only looking at the screen of her camera Even then, only in short glimpses And never directly at any of the drawings. He understands what she's saying, but it still doesn't make any sense. What are you doing? I'm not sure if I'm going to be a good person. I'm not sure if I'm going to be a good person. I'm not sure if I'm going to be a good person. Despite the burst of energy he received from the vodka, Koji is so exhausted from the night and well. The fear is affecting his body, making him dizzy and nauseous. Soon the walls are covered by a, a black paint, and the stale air is thick with the smell of turpentine. Ryoko says with relief, then tosses the empty can aside and puts away her video camera. Koji asks, supporting himself against a nearby table. Ah! Hmm? Without stopping her examination of the papers on the right table, Roka points nonchalantly to a Chinese style screen standing in the corner of the room. He was there. Her clinical choice of tense makes her meaning instantly obvious. 
The urge to see for himself is irresistible. Koji staggers across the room to the screen, taking the utmost care to not look at any of the steely octopus things that is painted on it. Behind the screen is a large easy chair, though he's never met the man before. Koji is fairly certain that this person sitting in it is Ogai Makashiro. Boo. Ogai's corpse must have shrunk significantly while drying in this sealed chamber. The body is barely the size of a child's, and with only the business suit hanging from the bones offering any hint of Ogai's former stature. His empty eye sockets and wide open jaw are filled with the darkness. The same darkness that surrounded Koji at the bottom of the well. Compared to those gaping voids, the tiny hole in Ogai's right temple is almost demure. The revolver that he presumably used to kill himself is still clenched in his dangling right hand. He looks like a child's toy compared to Ryoko's shotgun. Ryoko must have noticed Ogai's corpse while she was spray painting the walls. And still she kept writing, or working without batting an eyelash. Impressive. Though not exactly surprising after what he's been through. It's getting difficult to remember the last time he spoke to someone sane. But if not for her, Koji reminded himself with a bitter smirk. He would have ended up joining this mollified corpse here. And no one would have ever found him. Koji's vision suddenly dims. He's pushed himself too hard, and this... Spiritus Vodka can't help him anymore. He collapses to the floor, unable to hang onto his slipping consciousness. The last thing he sees are Ogai Makashiro's gaping eye sockets staring at him. When he wakes up, Koji finds himself lying on something dry and soft. A bed is a bed, he thinks to himself. Even one that smells of mold and dust, and especially after sleeping in cold mud all night. There are no lights hanging from the ceiling, but the soft warm lights of the lamps fill the room. Simple furnishings, non-existent decor. Koji realizes that he's in Ogai's cabin, in the bedroom that he's searched for Fuminori pushed him into the well. Riko is sitting in a chair against the wall. Her expression blank as she studies the pile of documents on the table in front of her. She must have brought them from a guy's underground lab. She turns a page and then takes a bite of the sandwich in her free hand. Without looking up from the files, she gestures towards the convenience store bag sitting on the nightstand. Koji can't imagine a woman, even a woman like Ryoko, could have climbed out of the well with him on her back. Ryoko mutters, taking care not to let the ex explanation interfere with her eating or reading. Kuro after finished her sandwich, Ryoko picks up some unsorted papers with her free hand and waves them in the air. The world Koji still hasn't the slightest idea of what Ogai's secret might have been. From what Ryoko said in that tunnel, however, he can guess that Fuminori is somehow involved. Koji asks desperately, no longer caring who he gets answers from. Ryoko replies coldly, as though Koji's concerns are not hers. Ryoko 
Ruger pulls several sheets of loose leaf paper from a different file. Danga Ongai ni Ketsian Shawa inai. Watashiwa Sakisaka Kunga Uso Tsuite Irumono to Bakari o Motita. Danga Mo Hitotsu no Kano Seo Kanga Rebeki Data. Kareva Ongai no Shinzoko o Nanoru Nanimono Kani, Sosono Kasarete Itano Kamo Shirenai. Ruko pauses and looks side longly at Koji. Saya to you Namaini. She sighs bitterly, then returns her attention to the papers in her hand. もし先坂君がこのサヤと呼ばれるものとすでに深く関わっているのなら彼はもう引き返せないところまで踏み込んでいるということになる The IC certainty in Ryoko's voice sends a chill down Koji's spine だとしたらどうするつもりなんです He has to ask even though he already knows the answer さっきも言ったよね一年前の私も手元に銃を持ってればってどれだけ後悔したか知れないんだ。Ryoko replies, smirking at the tension in Koshi's voice. もう二度と後悔するつもりはない。俺が警察に行けば済むことです。Ryoko doesn't respond, as though she doesn't even hear what Koshi just said. 海のりがやったことは殺人未遂です。俺が訴えれば、あいつは犯罪者として。Koshi continues persistently. 目撃者は、物証は。Ryoko cuts him off harshly. Na, Tono kun. Kimi wa kesatsu no shigoto ni tsuite hidoku kanchigai shiteru. Kare ra no shokubun wa seigi o tsuranuku koto demo, shimin no anze o mamoru koto demo nai. So, so na. Ujori na monogoto ni tsuite, kichin to jori ni sotta teisai o totono eru. これが警察っていう役所の仕事だ。彼らの思考はいつだってより理解しやすい方、より説明しやすい方に傾いていく。それこそ水が低い方へ低い方へと流れていくように。事実がどうあろうと彼らには興味ない。彼らが感知するところではないんだよ。小説より気なる事実なんてものは。そこまで決めつけることないでしょう。話してみなければわかりませんよ。そう、わからない。そこが問題だ。Ryoko states that she pulls another sandwich out of the bag. She hasn't spared Koji a second glance since the look at him earlier. While even while talking, her attention is always focused on the papers in front of her. 君が錯乱した親友の手で井戸に落とされたと主張する。すると警察はあと2つばかり真実の候補を用意するだろう。君が狂言自殺で親友を陥れようとしているとか、あるいはもっとシンプルに、事故で井戸に落ちた君が錯乱して親友を疑っているとか、この3案のどれかが捜査っていうレースで勝ちを競うわけだ。勝ち馬は誰にもわからない。こんな爆地に君は寝台潰すまでかける機会。Koji has no response. Can he really explain with cold, clear logic what drove Fuminori to do what he did? Can he even convince anyone else that he doesn't even understand himself? そして一番の問題は。Ruko says calmly, cutting into Koji's thoughts. 君がそういうランチ期騒ぎに手こずっている隙に。先々文則を追い詰めるチャンスを逃すことだよ。身辺で火の手が上がれば、彼は手遅れになる前にさっさと姿をくらますだろう。そう。私が大害を取り逃がしたようにね。ああ。Koji has a heavy silence falls upon them. With only the soft rustle of pages turning in Ryoko's hand to mark the passage of time. Kyoji says, his hushed voice breaking through the quiet. 
そこまで許しがたいことって何なんです Once again, Ryoko ignores Koji's question. This time, however, Koji doesn't back down. His silent glare demands her attention as she pours through the documents before her. After some time, Ryoko rearranges the papers in her hands and sets them aside as though having come to some conclusion. She then turns her chair to face Koji for the first time since he awoke. Nah, Tonoku. Her heart stare relays the calmness in her voice.君はここいら辺で降りた方がいい。ナスカ日光の温泉でゆっくり羽を伸ばして、何もかも忘れる気になってから東京に戻ってきなさい。忘れろ。コジ Ryoko replies, coolly rebuffing Koji's anger. Now,今までは、どうであれ。これからの君の人生に、その二人は一切関わりを持たないだろう。断言してもいい。じゃあ、つくばは! Koji shouts, unable to control himself. 彼女はどうなる? あの子は電話口で俺に助けを求めてた。どこかでひどい目に遭わされてたんだ! そりゃ何十時間前の話かね。私が君を助けてから何時間経ったと思うそうでなければ井戸の中の君が後何時間持ったと思う遅すぎるよ彼女はとっくに死んでるだろう誰もが君ほど幸運だなんて思わない方がいい She shakes her head and declares coldly あんたは Koji's growls Unavailable to suppress his anger. Ano ido de ore no shitai o mitsukete mo. Anta, nan tomo omoara katta ndaro na. So lia kakumo shite ta kara ne. Masaka ikiteru to wa omoana katta yo. Ryoko says with a shrug, unfazed by Koji's ire. It is futile to argue with this woman, Koji realizes. Her values are fundamentally different from his own. Nothing he can do will ever move her. Koji gets out of bed and stands on his shaking legs. Koji looks at his watch and sees that it's four in the morning, which means that it's already early evening when Ryoko rescued him. He can't believe that he survived in that well for almost two days. Now that the gaps in his memory have been filled and his sense of time has returned, he realizes it's already Sunday morning. Ryoko's right. A lot of time has passed since he spoke to Yo on the phone. Koji grabs a sports drink and two jelly stacks from the bag of food that Ryoko brought, then heads to the door. His legs are still a little unsteady, but he can compensate with a sheer willpower. Koji replies briskly. His tone is hard as hers. Koji is expecting Ryoko to watch him go with that cold, mocking smile of hers. Instead, she sighs heavily and rests her jaw in her hands. She thrusts her chin at the mountain of papers in front of her. Oogai가さやと名付けたものが何だったのか答えが隠されてるはずだそいつを突き止めてちゃんと対策を講じてから動くべきだと私は思う筑波が死んでると決めてかかってるあんたなら当然そう思うでしょうね in truth, Koji is extremely uneasy about going it alone. At the same time, however, he knows that he mustn't depend on Ryoko. She's made it clear that she doesn't care about saving lives. Teaming up with her will only make it more difficult to salvage anything, something from this nightmare. Tonoku. Ryoko calls up before Koji steps out the door. She picks up something from the table and casually tosses it to Koji. Koji catches it, 
feeling he feels a solid weight fill his hands. Koji stares at the menacing shape in his cold of cold metal. It's a revolver, the same one that was clenched in Ogai's skeletal fists. If Koji were his usual self, he would reject the dangerous offering. Surely no good can come from the barrel of a gun. And yet, without knowing it, Koji has already set foot into Ryoko's world, choosing instinctively over reason. He accepts the small but deadly weapon and slides it into his pocket. There's no question that Koji intends to save Yo from Yo and bring Fumiori to ask for his crimes. In the back of his mind, however, he can hear the footsteps of Ruin approaching. And that's where we're in things for now. Thank you all for watching part seven of Song of Saya. So, Koji lives, and Ryoko has a secret. With Ogai. Hmm. We'll find out more next time on part 8 of Song of Saya. Until everyone, thanks for watching, hope you enjoyed, and I'll see you all next time.